Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. My name is Maggie, and I'm the executive director of Protect Minnesota, which is the only state-based, statewide gun violence prevention organization in our state. And um, we're here today because gun violence is a terrible and pervasive issue in our state. We know that we lost 569 lives in Minnesota in 2022 to gun violence. We also know that every single one of those, li uh, of those lives lost was preventable. We know that this is a huge issue that impacts every single person in our state. We know that it's making our state unsafe for children, for law enforcement, for neighborhoods, communities, for all of us. Um, and we did so much great work on gun violence prevention. The, this past legislative session, we passed uh, extremist protection orders, universal background checks, funding for community violence intervention services, and those are all going to make our community safer. But we know that when we're losing almost 600 people a year in our state to gun violence, we haven't yet done enough to curb this epidemic. Um, and that's what we're here today to ask for, is for action this year from our legislature on gun violence in Minnesota. Um, so thank you so much for being here. And with that, I will turn it over to Representative Herr. Thank you, Maggie. I'm State Representative Kali Vang Her, and I'm the chief author of House File 601, which is requiring reporting of lost and stolen firearm. And the Senate chief author to that bill is Bonnie Westlin. Uh, this issue is really important to me because I am a firearms owner, um, and I've taken hunter safety, gun safety, and conceal and carry. Uh, this issue uh, is important because I understand the responsibility of owning a gun. This bill was introduced last year with the support of law enforcement. In a letter from local law enforcement, it was reported that gun theft is a growing problem. This is consistent with what we are seeing nationally. In a 2017 study by the National Le Library of Medicine estimated that 380,000 guns are stolen in the United States each year, equivalent to one every 90 seconds. According to the FBI, an estimated 1.8 million guns were stolen in the United States between 2012 and 2017, with more than 11,000 of those firearms being stolen in Minnesota. Gun uh, stolen guns often end up in the, in the illegal gun market. This is an appealing source of firearm for people who are legally prohibited from owning guns. Lost and, stolen, uh, lost and stolen reporting laws can help prevent straw purchases. These are purchases in which someone who can legally purchase a firearm buys it for someone who cannot legally buy it for him or herself. Without reporting laws, straw purchasers can simply claim that a gun that they bought and gave to a prohibited person was lost or taken in an unreported theft. Finally, lost and stolen uh, helps uh, Lost and stolen laws help prevent gun trafficking across state lines. One study found that crimes originating in states with a lost or stolen report in law were 30% less likely to end up in another state than guns that came from states without such laws. Currently, 16 states have some type of law requiring reporting. It is time for Minnesota to follow suit. This is a common sense firearm bill and is supported by law enforcement. It is time for us to take partisan politics out of this discussion and pass this piece of legislation. Next, I'll turn it over to Representative uh, Cedric Frazier. Thank you, Representative Hur, and, and I just want to say thank you before I get started to all the speakers that are going to speak today. Um, you know, it takes all of us to do this. It takes all of us to keep our communities safe and ensure that our communities are safe. I am Representative Cedric Frazier, District 43A. I represent the cities of Crystal and New Hope. And I'm going to talk today about uh, the legislative proposal dealing with uh, Medicaid state plan amendment proposal. Um, it's House File 3834, which would direct the DHS to submit a state plan amendment to the Center for Medicaid and Medicare Services that would allow Minnesota to draw down federal Medicaid money to help pay for violence prevention professionals in their services. Why is this important? Community violence is a public health crisis that reaches across all levels of the socioeconomic spectrum. Injuries stemming from community violence are estimated to be around $557 billion for B. Uh, this violence also comes at the cost of community safety and the well-being of our children and families. The presence of violence in communities is associated with chronic acute conditions such as poor mental health, reduced cognitive function for children, and inequity in housing, economic opportunity, and educational attainment. For example, nationwide, two-thirds of gunshot survivors are also on Medicaid or uninsured. Medicaid plays an integral role in treating the health needs of people who have suffered from violent injuries. 
Broadly, Medicaid allows for states to reimburse the work of violence prevention professionals who provide comprehensive wraparound services to survivors of violent injury, including gun violence. So why this approach? The vast majority of affected populations will be Medicaid expansion, meaning 90% of the costs will likely be covered by federal funding. Currently, seven other states have already done something similar. Connecticut, Illinois, California, Oregon, Colorado, Maryland, and New York. Violence prevention professionals are certified by the Health Alliance for Violence Intervention to provide violence prevention services to eligible Minnesotans, if we put this in place. Violence prevention services improve community public health with positive behavioral change, re-injury prevention, and reduction of retaliatory violence. And we know from data that when we can get the service out to folks, it breaks the cycle of folks going back into the community to harm other folks. Because we also know that hurt people hurt people. And we're trying to break that cycle. So I'm going to step back and let the next speaker speak. I will stay around for questions, and I appreciate you all being here this morning. This is important work to do, and we need to keep moving on it. Good morning. Um, my name is Monica Jones, and I'm a St. Paul native of over 30 years. I have two children, Brandon, he's 24, and Daquan would be turning 22 this year. I was one of those lucky moms because my children's birthday were a day apart. Brandon's on April 10th, and Daquan's was on the 9th. When they were young, I would just celebrate both of their birthdays together. Unfortunately, we aren't celebrating their birthdays together any longer. On November 6th of 2019, Daquan was accidentally killed with a stolen gun by his classmates. He was only 17 years of old. He was only 17 years old. Also, on November 6th in 2019, I joined a club that I never signed up for. On October 31st, 2019, a teenage boy found a gun and his exact words were, I thought it was cool. After school, a few days later, he came to my home with my son, Daquan, to play video games. He passed the gun around where they took turns aiming the beam light on the wall in the basement of my home. In less than five minutes, the 15-year-old went to put the gun away inside the other boy's backpack, not knowing the gun was loaded. He aimed it and pulled the trigger, and it hit my son in the chest. Both boys did render aid to my son while waiting for EMTs, but my son did not make it. The owner of this gun has still not been held accountable. The gun was not properly stored, locked, or secured. There was no report that was made that it was lost or stolen. Safe storage of the firearm that was brought into the home could have, been sa could have saved my son's life because it had never gotten into the hands of that young man. Required reporting of lost and stolen fire, firearms to law enforcement could have saved my son's life because the gun, the gun owners would have understood their legal responsibility to track down the gun as soon as it went missing. We have to start holding gun owners accountable for their carelessness. My son would be alive today if that gun was safely secured. His death left the whole community traumatized. I raised both of my children to be great young men. Daquan was loved by so many of his peers. He was funny. He taught his teachers the newest dance moves. He stood up for kids who were being bullied. He was the captain of his football team, and we were making plans for visiting colleges together. The weekend before he was killed, he had taken the most handsome senior photos, but he never graduated from school. Daquan could have been your child, your child's friend, 
Please help today. Let's get this bill passed. Let's not let another mother go through what I'm going through. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. My name is Kawanis Valera, and I'm the um, program manager of Metro Youth Diversion Center. And um, I'm up here to talk about um, the importance of my story. Uh, I also had lost a child to gun violence at 13 years old, and I'm also a CVI worker. And it's very important that I stand up here to let the whole world know that losing a child to gun violence is, is, tra is tragic. And it's hard to go back on birthdays, Christmases, and things like that, especially being a single father of two other boys that's eight and 10 years old. And when I look at my kids, I see my older son and them. And I was like, if he was here to see his brothers. And um, standing up here with great gratitude and understanding that these bills really need to be passed to promote these CVI workers, because we out here on a daily basis making changes in these communities. When I talk about making changes in these communities, I have stopped so many mothers and fathers from going to the funeral firsthand. You know, talking people to putting down guns and getting some help with their mental or substance use problems or issues, because I understand that firsthand. I got lived experience with that. My team is a team of 15 guys that's out there on a daily basis trying to save lives and, and do it passionately and have compassion. They, they train in de-escalation. They also train through Narcan training. And the most important thing, they train through empathy, empathy and compassion and understanding of what another person going through. With that, I will pass it over to Contrail. Good morning. I'm Contrell Galloway. I'm the director of the Next Step program. We are the state's only hospital-based violence intervention program that's based out of HCMC, but we also serve North Memorial, Abbott Northwestern, and Children's Minnesota. <clears throat> our, the function of our program is really to help people heal socially, emotionally, and mentally after <clears throat> our medical team has healed them, has healed their wounds. Um, our program function, really how we do that is when folks are shot, stabbed, or assaulted, they come in, into our emergency departments, we have a team that will respond directly into the emergency room to see what's happening with them, what's happening with their loved ones, to see what's, how we can be helpful so that they don't go back out in the community to retaliate, so that they also know what's going on in the hospital, how they're being treated, because when folks come into our hospital, sometimes they are dehumanized by <clears throat> not only where they're coming from out in the community, but also by sometimes our own team. So we're there to rehumanize folks, because being shot is not normal. So we have to have a not normal response as we're responding to folks coming up to, to the hospital to be healed because that's what we're trying to do. Because as uh, we said, hurt people hurt people. But I always like to use the frame, heal people heal people. So we got to figure out a way, how do we heal folks so we can break that cycle of violence that's happening within our communities, that's happening within our families. So that's why I'm really encouraging that we pass this bill because we have folks out there doing life-saving works, but they're underfunded. And we have to figure out how do we get those programs funded so that we can break this cycle of violence that's, that's strangling our communities right now. Our, our program is only, a, a, uh, is only a, a part of the puzzle that can help do this. So we need others to be able to be funded to come along so we can break this cycle. And thank you for that. And I'll turn it back over. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. We'll be able to take a few questions now. Can someone speak broadly about the prospect of, of more gun legislation this year after, um, as you mentioned, a number of things passed last year? Is there an appetite to do more from Democrats in the majority? Yeah, so I'll say from our perspective, you know, we're an advocacy organization, and it's our job to talk about why these bills are so important, as you've heard here today. It's not necessarily our job to count votes. Um, what we're going to be focusing on doing is make sure that every single member of our legislator legislature understands why these bills are so crucial, why we need to act to save lives this session, um, in addition to all of the wonderful and life-saving bills that were passed last session. And I don't know if there's a representative who wants to speak to that as well, Representative Her. <clears throat> 
I do just want to say that I've had conversations with uh, Senator Latz, and um, there is appetite for us to have the bills heard. Um, these both, uh, my bill, the Lost and Stolen Firearm, and Representative Becker Finn's bill, the Secure Storage, those are two very common sense uh, gun bills. And uh, so um, we have uh, support of law enforcement as well with, uh, on those bills. And so I think that uh, the, um, I would say the, um, what's the right word for this? Uh, the the appetite for having these bills heard and really to get them across the finish line exists and it's and exists within our body. So my, my hope is is that we will get them across the finish line this year. I mean, events in Burnsville, there's an increased amount of support among members of the legislature, maybe even across the aisle. Um, I will just speak briefly to the fact that this has always been an issue for us. This has always been, and I think that if you look at public polls, that this is not a Republican or Democrat issue. We all know that gun violence is on the rise and that we uh, want to uh, put um, uh, sensible uh, gun uh, violence prevention uh, measures into place. And so uh, all of these uh, additional uh, incidents are just reinforcing the fact that this is a longstanding issue that we've all been working really hard to uh, to address. I know yes, please, thank you. <clears throat> to that question, I think, you know, what we're looking at here is uh, the issue of gun violence has been around a long time. You, we've just heard these community members here talk and share these traumatic stories about losing their loved ones. There is no way we can stop having this conversation. So until we can prevent those deaths, these conversations are important. Whether one thing or another sways it, what we do know are real people are losing real lives that mean a lot to them. And we must continue to have these conversations to put things in place to stop this and prevent it from happening. Do the Burnsville events provide any extra impetus uh, to passing this legislation? And would any of this legislation possibly have helped prevent what happened there, given that the uh, gunman was not legally owned? What, I, speak owned to, what, I, what I would say is listen to the <coughs> folks that were just up here sharing these tragic stories. And I would say to any of my colleagues that are in the legislature or any advocacy groups, or any groups, listen to the folks that are telling these stories. Listen to the pain, listen to the hurt, listen to the loss, and then you make a decision about what you want to do. President, President you mentioned the, the price tag um, for, for Medicaid for treatment of gunshot wounds, gunshot injuries, and recovery. Um, do we have state stats yet, or is there a way to ask the DHS to try to gather, or Department of Health to try to gather that information for, for Minnesota? I don't have that information on top of hand. I don't know if anyone here has any. Um, I can speak to that a little bit. I mean, in terms of state stats, this would be a new program to our state. There are some states that have already successfully implemented it and implemented this. Um, California and Delaware, are a couple, and New York are a few of them, and have seen that this has been um, productive in community and has helped reduce um, gun gun and firearm tragedies. I think beyond that, this is a fairly new program. It's something that uh, many states are piloting, and what we know is that these programs do impact our communities, they do make our communities safer, and they're underfunded and under-resourced. Representative Hur, you talked about um, straw purchasers and the, the hope is that the mandatory reporting would prevent that from happening. Um, I believe there was a bill last year that would have increased a penalty from gross misdemeanor, misdemeanor to a felony for people who buy a gun or transfer a gun to somebody who is not allowed to have it, is it, that didn't go anywhere? Is that something that could be a part of this? What do you think about that proposal? Yeah, and I, I don't know actually who carried that bill or um, the specifics of that particular bill, but if you don't have a law to actually require people to report it, then you don't have any mechanism to actually hold people accountable. And so I think that it is really important that this is the first step. I would be very open to uh, enhancing any way uh, to make um, you know, these bills stronger, but I would say that the first step is to get this across the finish line so that we can actually have ways to hold individuals accountable to be responsible gun owners. And do these two bills kind of represent the, the scope of what you think is possible for this legislative session? I know there were um, other ideas out there last year. I know the governor um, last month had said that maybe looking at regulation of ghost guns. Um, is there anything else on the table? Well, I think that there's always new bills being introduced, and there uh, are always uh, ideas, because we don't have one solution that is going to fix this problem. And so as we uh, 
see what other states are doing as our uh, own legislators come up with what they may think uh, is a, an additional solution that can be added. We're always going to explore those things, but these particular bills have been introduced for uh, a number of years now, and that you all know how legislation works. It actually takes a while for uh, legislation to actually um, get the momentum behind them in order to pass. And so we continue to welcome new ideas of how we can uh, reform uh, you know, gun bills so that we um, can prevent violence within our communities, but these are the ones that we have been pushing for the last few years, and we hope to get these across the finish line. Kirk, could you describe, <clears throat> so it sounds like the bill, first there's a requirement that someone report to law enforcement or lost or stolen gun, presumably with serial numbers if they have such things. And then is there a registry that then is can be referred to by police agencies who find a gun to, to sort of track back? How, how does it work in the, in the stream from reporting? So what I can say is that, you know, when we write laws, we write laws with the parameters giving the departments who have to execute on them uh, flexibility and how they, they choose to do that. Uh, so this one, this bill particularly just says that a person has to report a lost or stolen firearm within 48 hours of reasonably knowing that it has been stolen or lost and that uh, we're not prescriptive in the bill as to how the agency would have to actually track and monitor that information. They're the ones that understand their systems better and how that interacts with community. And so uh, those are the types of things that we would work with them on implementation on afterwards. Would there be any uh, way to go after people who maybe aren't aren't licensed carriers that report a lost gun, or would that basically prevent them probably from reporting a lost gun? Can you repeat that? If someone doesn't have a permit to carry and their gun is stolen, they probably wouldn't be people who report a lost or stolen gun, right? Well, we do have an indemnity clause in this particular bill that says that if you report it, it doesn't state whether you have, you know, um, that that or not, but that we do we don't want to punish people. What we want to do is encourage people to be a part of a system that is responsible for this. So if you report it and something happens and it's used, uh, you know, in in an incident, then then you're not held responsible for that. We think that that's really important because again, this isn't about punishing individuals. This is really about how do we create laws that help us have accountability and then prevent uh, future uh, incidents from happening with that lost or stolen gun. Are you still planning on? Um uh, the bill on the um, mandatory minimums for convicted felons in possession of a gun. I think you talked to the performer about that. We're having conversations around many bills. Um, that bill is, is, is more than just that. It all, that bill also deals with gun trafficking. It also deals with funding for CVI programs. It also deals with a dedicated fund for those that have been impacted by gun violence. Those are the things I think we should highlight around that bill, not just the one item. But I think we're going to have these conversations, as uh, Chair Herr said, you know, it's not one thing that's going to fix this. There's multiple things that we have to do. And I, what I will say to the folks is it took us years to get to this spot. We're not going to fix it overnight. But we must talk about the tools that we can put in place to help address the issue. I don't know who wants to, sorry, I kind of lost my voice. Um, I don't know who wants to answer this one. With Representative Becker Finn, not here, but um, St. Paul's. Safe storage bill hasn't really been enforced at all yet in the first seven, eight months it's been in, in effect. So what makes you think that it would be, it is, is it a better to have a statewide law or is it more enforceable on the statewide level? Like would, what's your sense of whether it would be enforced if it was a statewide um, law? Um, so I can't speak uh, for Representative Becker Finn's bill herself, but I am familiar because her bill and my bill actually work uh, really well together. And that I do believe that it is um, important to have a statewide so that we're not trying to figure I don't know how many of you uh, are gun owners or have been through any of these classes, but when you go through a class, each state has different laws. And if you are traveling across country, you have to know each state's law and then how that gun needs to be stored if there is one. It's actually, there's because it is piecemeal, this would have been really great if we could just do something at the federal level so that people do not have this type of responsibility. But I find that even at the state level, it is really important for us. I think it's wonderful that our cities are trying to put measures into place. But as a state, we should be responsible for our entire state so that a gun owner who, like, you know, some of my colleagues carry guns, right? They come from rural Minnesota to St. Paul. They shouldn't have to know in each city, each county they cross, what is that law going to be? And so I think just for simplicity uh, for those who are carriers that we should absolutely do something at the state level that I, I really they understand what safe storage is across the state, not whichever jurisdiction they're in. Yeah, and can I plug into that a little bit, which is just to say that um, polling shows that less than 50% of Minnesotans who own guns are safely securing them all the time. So for us, this is really a tool to help all gun owners understand that 
it's your responsibility as someone practicing safe gun ownership to keep that gun safely stored at all times. And I think it really is to get at that 50% of Minnesota gun owners who just aren't, um, aren't always involving those practices in their gun ownership. Jennifer, just one more point about your, your bill on the mandatory reporting. So if someone's gun, if they, if they didn't retur uh, report that their gun was stolen or missing within that 48 hour mark, and then, you know, it, it's like maybe a week later that they realize it's stolen or something to that effect. Is there then, if by not meeting that window, uh, a, a penalty or something if that gun was stolen and used in, in the commission of a, a violent crime? Or, or is it really, I mean, uh, how do you enforce that time frame? And is there, are there penalties beyond that 48-hour window? So the way the law is written is that when you become aware of it. So my gun might have been stolen. So I keep my gun at my farm. I'm not always at my farm. So I might not know that somebody's stolen that gun. But within when I find out, so I might not be there for two months. But when I get there and I realize my gun is gone, that's when I have 48 hours. So when you reasonably should have known that your firearm was missing or stolen. But is there a penalty if you didn't report that your there gun was stolen. Penalty. There's a penalty um, section. So on your first offense, it's a petty misdemeanor. If you have a second offense, it's a misdemeanor. And then on your third, uh, the third time, it's a gross misdemeanor. So yes, if you should have reported it and you were aware of it, there is a penalty for it. Like if it's recovered and it's, the, and it's discovered that it was stolen. Is there an education aspect that goes with that? Just, you know, to make the public aware, like, hey, this is, you know, make sure you report these things now that this law is in effect. Yeah, I think that like with every bill that we pass, there has to always be um, uh, some training. So, you know, there are individuals who will be coming into, you know, uh, owning a firearm and they go through certain classes. Um, I wish those classes were longer and more in-depth, but they're not. But in, within those classes, like that's where I, I learned within states, uh, different laws. And so that will happen. But I also believe that there will have to absolutely be some kind of public uh, campaign uh, for those who already own guns who might not be going through a certification again. But again, those are some of the details that we would have to work with uh, our departments in executing on. So I think we have time for one more question. People have to get back to committee hearings and other activities. Is there anything else? I just did. Um, I may have missed this because I was paying attention to my viewfinder, but um, Ms. Jones, is the cutout, is that Daquan? Yes. Very handsome boy. Thank you. There's one other thing the picture. Did you also say that you know, did you find out whose gun it was and they haven't been held accountable or you didn't know? No, so I still haven't found out. Um, the young man said he found it in a car. Um, so there's still question whether or not that was on school property. And um, and then because he was a minor, I didn't have the privilege to, to get information regarding the case of him being charged for having a, a, a gun. Right. Thank you all. Representative Fraser, could I ask you an off-topic question? Since we're no, not an off-topic question. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, 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 I'll talk to you. Hey, guys. All right, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah.